Life was never meant to be easy here in the frozen wasteland. Harsh weather conditions, bandits lurking around every corner, ongoing civil war, world-eating dragons. Hell, even ancient vampires have decided that now is the right time to rebel against the sun. There is pain and struggle on every step, as life itself here among the ruins becomes more than a mere survival. It becomes a fight against overwhelming odds. Fourth era Skyrim is perhaps Skyrim at its darkest, bleakest moment. As generic as it sounds, I always thought of Elder Scrolls V as a post-apocalyptic fantasy game, old western set in medieval Nordic setting. Quite a mixture of genres, I know, but that's how this game works for me. There's a sense of an error, anomaly, a glitch in the matrix, of something terribly going wrong. So terrible that it threatens the existence of an entire timeline. Every faction, town, every element of present-day Skyrim is but a mere shadow of its former self, at its last decaying stage. And this could probably extend to the most of Tamriel. So if we assume that Skyrim is post-apocalypse, then what was the apocalypse? The Oblivion Crisis, Red Year, or both? Whatever it was, it left the world scarred and hopeless. There's a deep yearning for a new hierarchy, for something new to emerge and restore the natural order. This hunger is very much felt in Skyrim, land burdened with corruption and moral decay. To give just one example, let's take a look at the Companions, one of the most honorable factions in the history of Skyrim, dating all the way back to Isgramor, a faction of heroes and ultimate glory seekers, whose songs echo in the very halls of Sovngarde, now reduced to glorified mercenaries beating up random civilians for coin and led by cursed, bloodthirsty lycanthropes. Obviously, in a world that hangs on the brink of collapse, finding an honest force for good could prove challenging. But amidst all of this chaos and decay, there's a group dedicated to preserving life and order. And this group happens to be also single most overlooked, if not outright hated faction among Skyrim's players. In fact, it's so disliked that even developers kinda removed them from a game through one of the DLCs, but more on that later. Vigilance of Stendar, hate them or love them, need little introduction. You speak to a Vigilant of Stendar. Cavort with any Daedra and we will hunt you down. They are the religious, some would say fanatical order of robed warrior priests. And they also happen to be my favorite faction in Skyrim. I know, it's bizarre. But believe me, I'm not trying to be a contrarian. Today I'll offer my take on the Vigilance and try to explain why I find them kind of fascinating and with that perhaps restore some justice for these misunderstood Daedra Hunters. And when I say misunderstood, I refer to a number of online articles written about the Vigilance that almost always fail to see the bigger picture. This is my only second Skyrim analysis video, as I on this channel mostly cover all things Morrowind. So I really hope that you will enjoy our little occasional adventure to the north. My name is Alec and thank you for watching. Stendar be with you. For starters, let's cover the origin of the Vigil. And I'd also like to briefly cover the history behind this and similar religious orders. Because you see, Vigilants are by no means a new concept. There's a very old tradition of similar factions dating all the way back to the first era. And we are talking specifically about the groups dedicated to Stendar. It turns out that whenever there's a major disaster, a crisis, one of these factions emerges almost as a reaction to an ongoing terror. So the Vigil of Stendar is not an exception. The Vigil was founded following one of the most catastrophic events in the history of Tamriel. And we are talking of course about the Oblivion Crisis. Yes, our order was founded after the Oblivion Crisis. 
We dedicate our lives to facing the threat of Daedra wherever they appear. This event was the main plot of Elder Scrolls IV and essentially marked the end of the Third Era. Needless to say, Oblivion Crisis left Tamriel and its people deeply traumatized as endless hordes of Daedra invaded towns and villages across the entire continent. Mortal Realm was in danger of being literally swallowed by the hellish realm of a Daedric prince Mehrunes Dagon. Saved only in the last moment by Martin Septim, the last of the Septim bloodline, who, by the way, for this occasion transformed into a dragon avatar of Akatosh and defeated the Daedric Prince in a rather epic climactic ending. In the end, Dagon was expelled back to the Deadlands and the very gates of Oblivion were sealed forever, thanks to the restored barrier. However, this protective barrier between Nern and Oblivion is only meant to prevent large-scale invasions. Lesser Daedra was and still is present on Tamriel, mainly through conjuration, and Daedric princes continue to have limited influence being even able to manifest. For example, we witnessed Sanguine freely walking around in a human form, or Barbas, and so on. Even Oblivion's DLC, Shivering Isles, ironically involves a direct portal to Oblivion, Sheogorod's realm. And in Skyrim, we have a chance of visiting several realms of Oblivion, including Apocrypha. Again, this is explained by the fact that as long as these gates or portals pose no global threat to the world of mortals, they are let's say, allowed to exist. In a way, they serve as imitations to mortals to enter oblivion. With that said, Daedra and specifically Daedric princes are the very embodiment of trickery and it's almost certain that they will attempt another invasion. If anything, at least out of pure spite. It's simply in their DNA, if they even have it. And the nature of Mundus, the mortal world, is such that nothing lasts forever. So even the fate of the protective barrier is uncertain. With all of that in mind, it's understandable for common people of Tamriel, especially after the Oblivion Crisis, to be less sympathetic to Daedra and the Daedra worship. And it's exactly this widespread anti-Daedra and even anti-magic sentiment that gave birth to the Vigil of Stendar. What's there to tell? It's mostly gone now. Thanks to those damn mages in the college. Those early years of the Fourth Era were truly chaotic, as many cities across Tamriel were fully devastated. Empire itself was torn apart from within, and not to mention the Red Year, which left most of Morrowind in ruins. It was a difficult time, full of painful, permanent changes. For example, the famous Mages Guild collapsed and split into two rivaling factions, Synod and the College of Whispers. And the major cause for the collapse of Mages Guild was the problem of necromancy and conjuration, which of course involves summoning Daedra. So to put it more bluntly, people had enough of mages and their magic. And there's this subtle suggestion that magic is slowly fading away from Tamriel, although it would be more accurate to say that it's the understanding and acceptance of magic that's on slow, steady decline. Magic isn't fading away. As long as there are stars and the sun in the skies, there will be magic. But enough about that. This little historical background is meant to help us understand the political and the sociological climate during the rise of the Vigil of Stendar. The Vigil represented the common will of the people, at least it did in those early days, following the Oblivion Crisis. In fact, I'd imagine that the Vigil was comprised mostly of regular, angry mob gathered around the priesthood of Stendar, by people who, during the invasion, lost their loved ones or entire hometowns, people who had nothing left to lose. Remember the scene in Mortal depicting angry mob outside the Jarl's Hall, protesting against the local wizard and the Jarl Idgrod's mysticism? It's the exact same attitude or a perspective formed around the hatred of all things mystical that fueled the formation of Vigil and all other similar militant organizations two centuries ago. We do know of at least one more militant anti-Daedra group called Keepers of the Razor, and similar movements were definitely founded and operate across the Empire. Because there were plenty of free-roaming Daedra left behind that needed to be expelled from the realm. 
And secondly, surviving cultists of the mythic dawn, their sympathizers and other conjurers and necromancers, they simply had to be dealt with, so the all-out war on dark magic was about to get serious. Now, I said that the vigil was mostly comprised of common folk, as I believe and call it my personal headcanon, if you will, that Vigil of Standar had to have some connection to the official priesthood of Standar. To better understand this relation, let's take a look at the history of Standaran Temple. You see, Temple of Standar was historically known for its knightly order, called, not surprisingly, Knights of Standar, or simply, Crusaders, whose sacred duty was to protect the temple. In fact, every temple within the Imperial Divine Pantheon had its own militant branch, or a knightly order, dedicated to a cause and guided by philosophy and principles related to the specific deity. So it's interesting that it were the Knights of Stendar who were the standard crusaders, heavily armored warriors whose job was to hunt monsters and villains while mastering the school of restoration. And as we know, in classic Elder Scrolls franchise there is a playable crusader class. In both Morrowind and Oblivion, Crusader is a generic class somewhat similar to a knight, with the difference being that Crusaders have the knowledge of a destruction magic, alchemy, and use blunt weapons. And we can already see the similarities with the Vigilance of Standar, who, as we're gonna see later, are required to learn the arts of alchemy, restoration, and destruction while building maces. However, compared to the more heavily armored historical crusader, typical vigilant relies more on health and agility, and fits more into the role of a witch hunter. Again, we will talk more about that in a later segment. For now, I just wanted to mention the fact that the vigil isn't first a militant order dedicated to Standar, and that besides the Knights of Standar, there were even other and older organizations, like Resolutes of Standar and Templars. All these factions have a rather obscure lore, being mentioned only in few in-game books, so there isn't much about their background. However, they do for the most part follow a common thread. They were all dedicated to rooting out so-called Four Abominations. Daedra, man-beasts, vampires, and undead. And this doctrine of the Four Abominations, the very core of Stendaran teaching, dates back to the First Era and Vinicius Imbrax, Archbishop of Coral who wrote the Four Abominations. I'm going to read it because, as we're gonna see, it remained relevant all the way to the current Fourth Era, as it's being adopted and followed to the world by the Vigil of Stendar. So let's read the four abominations. Thus Stendhal looked upon the world of mortals, and he found it afflicted by abominations. And he made it known unto his priests, resolutes, and templars, that these unnatural profanities are abhorrent in his sight, and are to be exterminated by the righteous without halt of mercy. For these abominations are each and every the eternal enemies of the mortals of the Mundus, and shall not be suffered to abide among us. And these abominations are four in kind, and may be known thusly, the Daedra, those unworldly horrors that are not of the Mundus, but come from oblivion to inflict cruelty and death upon the mortals of Tamriel. The man-beasts, those mortals who through traffic with the bestial herson do change their skins for those of animals, praying dance upon the innocent. The risen corpses, those restless undead whose rotting bodies persist with loathsome and unnatural vigor, sowing fear and agony among the living. The deathless vampires, who feed horrifically upon honest citizens, regarding righteous mortals as mere cattle to sate their unholy hungers. Know these four abominations, O ye righteous, and gather to slay them where they appear. In other words, when Vigilance of Standard talk about the four abominations, and any other abominations that prey on mortals, vampires, werewolves, witches, but the Daedra are the worst. Their callous disregard for our lives is abhorrent in the eyes of the God of Mercy. They are referring back to the temple teachings from the very first age, written down thousands of years ago. And before we jump into analyzing the current state of the faction, I'd like to point out a few more details regarding the history of Stendaran militant organizations. I haven't played ESO, which is where we learn about Templars and Resolutes of Stendar, who are 
it looks like prototypes or precursors of the Vigilance. But there's also a major focus on the so-called light or holy magic. There seems to be a discussion whether this holy magic originates from the priesthood of Stendhal or was it merely adopted by them. In Skyrim, we see a trace of this magic in a powerful spell called Standar's Aura, which was added by Dongard DLC. I'm gonna be honest, I don't know much about the origin of the holy magic used by priests of Standar, so I'm not going to cover this particular topic. However, there are some fun theories out there, one of which considers Meridia as the true secret source of this magic, mostly due to its advanced anti-undead effects. From what I know, there's no actually proof of that, and the mystery of the origin of holy, light-based standards magic remains just that, a mystery. With that said, I'm a simple guy and if in-game spell has a literal name, Standard's Aura, I'll take it literally, word for word. Walk always in the light, or we will drag you to it. There is also a second important Standaran doctrine written by Ptolus the Bright, who was a resolute of Standar. I want to mention it because I think it also played a role in shaping the concept of the Vigil of Standar. So in a text called Precepts of Standar, it says, Standar's faithful are blessed by the great revelations in the healing arts. If you seek his wisdom, will the gift of restoration magic in his name. Follow his precepts and make yourself vulnerable to his will. So here are the precepts of Standar. Number 1. Never refuse aid you are capable of providing. Number 2. Go among the infirm and the wounded wherever you find them. Number 3. Offer prayer to Standar every day. And number 4. Do not hoard wealth or indulge physically. This particular quote explains the charitable and merciful side of Stendaran orders. Besides being monster-hunting crusaders, they were also renowned healers, sworn to a life of poverty. Stendar is in fact one of the main gods historically related to healing, and combined with the principle of justice, charity and the hatred for the abominations, his portfolio creates a unique blend of militaristic and monastic or religious way of life. So let's conclude this chapter. We mentioned that Stendaran orders existed since the very first era and have a strong militaristic ideology. They traditionally combat all the enemies of the mortals as holy crusaders while also serving as healers. Even the knights of Stendar were sworn to charity and compassion. Following this tradition, Vigil of Stendar was founded immediately after the Oblivion Crisis, presumably in Cyrodiil with the goal of hunting down Daedra and providing healing. So with this basic knowledge of the order, let's take a look at the in-game faction and see what exactly went wrong. As with all the other factions encountered in game, Vigil of Standar is almost certainly in a much weaker, disorganized state compared to its former days. First of all, it's been 200 years since their founding. And secondly, Skyrim's chapter seems to be isolated from the main center and operates largely on its own. Still, the fact that the faction as a whole managed to survive for so long and spread throughout Tamriel proves that at one time it had to be quite a successful, well-connected organization. The main headquarter, Hall of the Vigilant, is quite easy to miss as it's off the road, hidden on a snow-covered mountain southwest of Dawnstar. Secluded location of the Hall and the fact that it's little more than a simple lodge and not some well-protected fort, to me speaks foremost about their need for secrecy and spirituality. The Vigil is in many ways a puritanical order, seeing itself detached from the world of corruption and sin. Vigilants serve as priests and monks, and their hall is also their monastery. In fact, Vigilant Tolan described the hall as a place of respite and learning, since Vigilants spend most of their lives as nomads, in a never-ending quest against evil. So, in a lack of better words, the Vigil is a largely decentralized faction, with most members not even knowing their true number. However, at the same time, there's a sense of camaraderie among the Vigilants, who genuinely seem to care for each other. Leader of the Vigilants, Keeper Carset, is also found in the hall. She has a unique introduction dialogue and is appropriately an expert healer, offering restoration training to the player. 
And that's pretty much it about her. Keeper Corset is, in my opinion, one of the most underrated NPCs in Skyrim. There's an aura of mystery around her. She doesn't say much and spends entire day in this contemplative state while leaning on the altar of Standar, as if she is constantly in this state of prayer. I always thought that she was kinda unutilized, and there's also a fact that most players won't even meet her since she disappears from the game at the very beginning of Dawnguard questline, which occurs at level 10, considering the remote northern location of the Hall of the Vigilance, and the fact that level 10 is fairly easily achievable, there's a very very good chance to miss this character completely. I will have a separate chapter on what I call Dawnguard problem later on, where I plan to discuss this and some other issues I have in regards to the way game and especially Dawnguard DLC treats the vigilance of Standar. But as for Keeper Corset, it's also interesting that she's one of the rare Breton members. Nearly all vigilance come in one of the three races, Nord, Redguard and surprisingly Dunmer. There's also one unique Imperial, Vigilant Tyrannus, and one more Breton, Morik Sidri. I think it's fair to assume that Vigilants have chapter at least in High Rock and Hammerfell, besides of course Skyrim and Cyrodiil as their main base. High Rock is famous for having plenty of religious and knightly orders, plus Bretons are good with magic, and Standar is traditionally popular in Hammerfell, with him being a favorite god among Redguard knights. So having Breton and Redguard members isn't unusual at all, but what's with the Dunmer? Well, it's actually not that surprising. Dunmer society suffered a major turbulation during the Red Year, causing yet another religious reformation. And I think that many Dunmer would feel betrayed by Azura who, as we found out, saved only selected few from the coming disaster, by sending prophetic dreams only to those she seemed worthy enough. I just think that many Dunmer will feel betrayed by this unpredictable Daedric overlord, enough to even sway some of them into joining factions like the Vigil of Standar. I mean, in Skyrim we also meet Erandur, a Dunmer priest of Mara who previously worshipped Daedra. So let's stay at the Hall of the Vigilant for a little bit more. I always found this place very relaxing. There's a large fire pit with plenty of food around, providing good amount of warmth to this simple wooden lodge surrounded by cold mountain winds. It's so quiet in there as vigilants either eat, read or prayer. There are no scripted dialogues between them, like with the usual generic NPCs in towns. Hall feels like a monastery, place for respite and learning, as vigilants dedicate a lot of time studying their enemy. Speaking of books, there's a copy of the Knights of the Nine, a heavy armor skill book. It tells a story of the legendary knightly order that recovered the Holy Crusader's relic of Pelennal Whitestrake, and in oblivion we found out that gauntlets were made by Standar. To my knowledge, this could be the reason why would Vigilants have this book, as I don't think that they have any historical connection to the Knights of the Nine, both the original and the restored Second Order from the Third Era. A large table in the main room contains a shrine of Standar and several offerings, a Daedric heart, vampire dust, bone meal and a wolf belt, all symbolizing enemies of mortals. Hall also contains not one but two alchemy labs, confirming Vigilance specialization in brewing healing potions. As we already mentioned, Vigilance are also healers and each one of them always carries a cure disease potion. Skyrim is riddled with diseases and only way to cure them is with the said potions or by praying at the altar as there are, interestingly enough, no cure disease spells. Now, altars are mostly found in whole capitals, within temples, and aren't always available to the player, which makes Vigilance very useful because they are only faction that offers cure disease option, also free of charge. You're bloated with disease. The Vigilant of Stendar can help you, as long as you promise to never assist the Daedra. Stendar's light purify you of your ills. Besides the hall, Vigilants also own a small tower home of Stendar's beacon, near Riften. It's located very near the border with Morrowind and just south of Dayspring Canyon and Fort Dongard. It's usually occupied by three Vigilants and contains another shrine of Stendar. 
However, as we said, most of the Vigilants spend their days as nomads, traveling from place to place and fighting enemies of all kinds. It's a life of an endless, tireless crusade, life of poverty and struggle. Roads of Skyrim are filled with many dangers, and Vigilants can be seen fighting not only roaming Daedra, vampires or necromancers, but even regular bandits. Also, Vigilants always travel in pairs and end their patrols back at the hall. In combat, Vigilants exclusively use maces with additional fire magic. They also cast protective armor spell before combat, boosting their defense to a small degree. Overall, I think that they are far from incompetent, as many consider them to be, as they are proven to being able to defeat spawn Daedra, random bandits and dangerous wildlife, such as frost spiders. They are not elite fighters like high-ranking companions or master mages, but they are skillful enough to perform regular day-to-day -day tasks and survive to see the next day, most of the time at least. And I think that this general handiness is Vigilant's best quality, and at the same time their weakness, since for the most part they lack specialization. Typical Vigilant knows a little bit of everything, how to swing a mace, cast a protective or healing spell, brew a potion, studies history and lore, do some detective work, yet rarely do they achieve mastery over any of these skills. When Dawnguard kicks into the scene, one of Isran's, I'd say, more valid critiques of Vigilance is about their number. In particular, Isran isn't in favor of a large numbered factions, preferring a smaller, more professional organization. I'd say that there's some truth to that, as later on we find out that no one except the privileged few even know the true number of Vigilance in Skyrim alone. I wish I could say how many we numbered. But only a privileged few knew that, and they're dead now. I always found this particular line kinda strange. Are Vigilants supposed to be this secretive? Do they perhaps have some undercover agent network around that no one knows about except the leaders like Keeper Corset? Or is the whole faction meant to be so decentralized? Adding to that, there are also instances where Vigilants basically act as archaeologists, exploring and digging ancient ruins in search of artifacts, while writing notes and commentaries on architecture and history. It was Vigilant Adelwald who discovered and explored the Dim Hollow Crypt while commenting on its unique architectural style, and Vigilant Morik Sidri discovered the ruins of Runewald while having an entire team of Vigilants serving as archaeologists. To me this is one of the most overlooked aspects of the Vigil of Standar, as it seems that at least some among them genuinely have a scholarly interest and a talent for digging up and researching ancient sites. A genuine academic work. This isn't a common sight or occurrence in present day Skyrim, so kudos to them. There's also a question of Vigilant's hostility to all Daedra worshippers, and whether this includes entire races of Orcs and Dunmer, since as we know, they worship Daedra. I think that the answer is pretty obvious. Vigilance would have to follow a certain priority list. So for example, worshippers of Merun's Dagon or Malak Bal would be a tough priority and be actively hunted down, while peaceful worshippers of Azura or Malakat would generally be considered low priority and be left alone. I don't think that Vigilance will just randomly attack an orcish stronghold or a group of regular Dunmer. It doesn't happen in game as well. There are simply too many bigger, more dangerous enemies out there on the front line. Speaking of enemies, I'd like to point out that when Vigilance comment on four abominations, they are in fact right, regardless of them sounding like some fanatics. All vampires and werebeasts are evil. 
Even sending an imprisoned lycanthrope in Falkrit couldn't control his bloodlust and murdered a little girl, no matter how hard he tried to restrain himself. As for the vampires, even a morally good person has a much greater chance of turning to the dark side simply because of the bloodlust. Power and immortality lead to greed and lust. Regardless of how good person in question is, it's only a matter of time before they slip. As for the Daedra, a book called A Tragedy in Black perfectly encapsulates all the danger of dealing with the Daedra, as it tells a story of an innocent young man summoning a Dremora and ending up murder and soul trapped. Daedra, as fascinating as they are, are never to be trusted, as their very existence is antagonistic to the mortals. So overall, I believe that Vigilants, for the most part, do their job efficiently. Considering that they are a bunch of regular humans risking their lives on a daily basis facing a much stronger enemy, I'd say that they should be given some credit. Got a witch hunter in town from the priesthood of Stendar. Keeps asking questions about that old abandoned house. On our journey across Skyrim, we have a chance of meeting some rare, unique vigilants. And Tyrannus is one of the most memorable ones, simply for a fact that he is tied to a popular Daedra quest, the House of Horrors. So you don't know anything about this house? No. Anyone seen entering or leaving? Any strange lights or unusual noises? It's abandoned, and it's always been abandoned. Excuse me. But do you know anything about this house? Seen anyone enter or leave? This quest always rubbed me the wrong way. It's one of the rare occasions where game leaves us no option and we are forced to kill an innocent character, Vigilant Tyrannus himself. I also find this scene a good example of Vigilant's typical day at work and the risk they face on a daily basis. I'm pretty sure that Vigilant Tyrannus, as he was about to enter the abandoned house, expected to encounter, let's say, a minor Daedra cult, perhaps a lesser summoned Daedra, but instead he got face to face with their arguably most evil and dangerous Daedric prince, Molag Bal. Now, I read many comments wondering why is Tyrannus so weak-minded and so easily broken by Molag Bal. But people forget that Tyrannus is just a regular guy, and although a witch hunter, he has no chance against the power of a Daedric Prince. Actually, no one has, and only reason player comes out alive is because we play as a literal demigod. But there's also something strange about Tyrannus. He's the only Imperial member of the Vigil in Skyrim. And as far as I know, only one to use shock damage spell instead of standard flames. So while doing a research, I found a really fun conspiracy theory on the Vigilant Tyrannus that I'd like to share. I'll say right away that I'm not actually agreeing with it, but it's really fun, so let's just hear it. So this theory states that Vigilant Tyrannus is Molag Bal. He forces Dragonborn to kill him, basically morally compromising him before picking up the Daedric Mace. He could be standing outside posing as a witch hunter and waiting for a potential champion, i.e. us, but one of the clues is that he is alone, and Vigilance, as we know, work in pairs, and Tyrannus being alone provides him with a reason to invite us inside. Another possible clue is, well, his name. Tyrannus. I admit, I also found somewhat strange and according to the theory, it's a pseudonym, meaning tyrant, a suitable name for someone like Molag Bal. And I'd also add that Tyrannus was the name of a Sith Lord, Darth Tyrannus or Count Dooku, who also used similar shock base spell, could be just another Star Wars reference, or perhaps there is some secret dark connection. It's Elder Scrolls, so anything is possible. We do know that Daedric Princes can manifest as regular people and walk around freely. I still believe that Vigilant Tyrannus was a solitary wandering witch hunter who unexpectedly and tragically faced an enemy he could never defeat. And that's a common theme all throughout our encounters with the Vigil of Standar, facing the greater threat. And with that in mind, I'd like to finally discuss the Dawnguard problem. I should start by saying that I love Dawnguard. 
the expansion, the faction, one of my favorites in the entire series. With that said, I always felt that Dawnguard did a big, big disservice to the Vigilance. As I played through the DLC for the first time, it was painfully obvious that developers wanted to portray Vigilance as pathetic and incompetent as possible. The hall of the Vigilance is in ruins. My brothers and sisters, dead or scattered. It felt sad and unfair. New content was supposed to flesh out some of the lore behind the Vigilance, introducing some ex-members and dialogues, but from the very start it felt like a pure assault, a humiliation ride on all things Vigilant. I always wondered if Dongar DLC originally involved Vigilance of Standar, only for them to be then replaced by a totally new faction, due to Vigilant's supposed bad reputation, but I never found anything to prove that. What we know for a fact is that originally Vigilance and especially Vigilant Tolan had a more important role at the early stages of the quest line, with Vigilant Tolan being our first quest giver at the Standard's Beacon, instead of Isran who would appear much later. But even that was scrapped and Vigilance are virtually erased from the game right from the beginning of Dawnguard. And because Dawnguard starts as low as level 10, like I said, it virtually means that most new players will never encounter the faction prior to its destruction. So when I say that developers removed an entire faction from the game, it's exactly what they did. And more than that, after witnessing the Hall of the Vigilant burn down and all the Vigilants laying dead, we then find Vigilant Tolan dead at the entrance of the Dim Hollow Crypt. Game never offers us a chance of having Tolan as a companion, since we are literally going to the same location to fight the same enemy. I'll meet you at Dim Hollow. It's the least I can do to avenge my fallen comrades. Tolan, I don't think that's a good idea. You vigilants were never trained. I know what you think of us. You think we're soft, that we're cowards. You think our deaths proved our weakness? Stendar granted you do not have to face the same test and be found wanting. I'm going to Dim Hollow Crypt. Perhaps I can be of some small assistance to you. It would only make sense for us to go there together, or at least meet there and fight together. It's really weird. Tolan will instead be found laying dead, dying a hero's death. Then at the end of Dim Hollow Crypt, we witness the death of another vigilant, Adelwald. Again, game will provide no option of saving his life. It's like every single vigilant is doomed to fail. But nothing prepared me for what happened next. You see, further down the quest line, there's a mission to recruit an imperial priest, Florentius, who was, as we discover, aiding a group of vigilants at the ruins of Runewald. So we go there and find out that the entire group of vigilants, led by Morik Sidri, was charmed by a single Altmer conjurer, who then made them worship her as a living goddess. So then, game, I'd say quite symbolically, forces us to fight and kill a number of mind-controlled vigilants on our path to saving the priest, who somehow is the only one who is not under the spell. And none of the vigilants are again capable of being rescued. Even if we kill the conjurer first, all the vigilants will just die. I honestly think that whoever wrote the Dawnguard questline really hated the Vigilance. And as cool as Dawnguard the faction is, I never thought of them as much better or more efficient than the Vigilance. Since this isn't a video about them, I'll refrain from analyzing the Dawnguard too much, but it's pretty obvious that the only way they are capable of defeating Lord Harkon is by having Dragoborn on their side. So, same would happen if Dragoborn joined the remaining Vigilance as well. Basically, there's one golden rule in Skyrim. Whoever has Dragoborn on their side wins the race. So in all honesty, I don't believe that even Dawnguard alone would stand much chance against the Voltihar clan, even with a highly defensive fort Dawnguard on their side. Yet, in the Battle of Factions, Dawnguard won over the Vigilance, and I believe this is purely because they have something else that Vigilance always lacked. Interesting characters. There was a time years ago when we were both members of the Vigilance, and both equally dissatisfied with them. Too extreme, they called me. Well, that doesn't seem to have worked out in their favor now, has it? 
Dongar definitely owns part of its popularity to these characters, as Isran, Kellan, Gunmar, Dorak, and the rest of the company have at least some kind of background story and in-group dynamics. Most of them know each other from before. They worked together, had a dispute, went separate ways, only to reunite once again. It may not be the most original writing, but at least it's something and makes the faction alive and interesting. On the other hand, Vigilance always lacked a proper, memorable character. There are a bunch of generic Vigilance and a leader who spends 90% of her time staring silently at a desk. Even their character design aesthetically is very bland and forgettable. For example, Vigilant Tolan, one of the last unique Vigilants that we meet in Skyrim, looks and behaves like a weathered old man suffering from early stages of dementia. It's too late for the Vigilance now. He just sounds tired and speaks slow, compared to more energetic, sharp members of Dawnguard, whose dialogues are full of confidence. Now that the Dawnguard are back, the vampire's reign of terror is about to end. And in regards to general appearance of the Vigilance, it's also interesting that except for Tolan and Corset, every one of them has a scarred face. Vigilants are definitely not made to look attractive or vigorous. Everything about their appearance is purposely plain and speaks volumes about their daily lives and burdens of being a vigilant. They are covered in dirt, scars, always tired, grumpy and on the edge. It must be a very stressful job. On a more serious note, vigilants were obviously sacrificed in order to elevate the enemy, clan Volkihar. To make them a greater threat, I just think that they deserved some kind of a redemption arc. Even their leader, Keeper Corset, is presumed dead, at least according to Tolan. Yet we never find her body. It's yet another strange detail or a decision made by developers. We do find a number of dead vigilants and vampires laying around the destroyed hall, but not Corset. It's as if she's being permanently deleted from the game. Again, could be symbolical. I don't believe in the theory that she's been stuck in the basement, which is, by the way, also removed in the destroyed version of the hall, as there's no reason for her to be in the basement. She spends all of her time upstairs, her room is upstairs, and as the leader of the Vigilance, she will be the first one to fight till the very end. One possible explanation is that one of the unrecognizable burned bodies belongs to her. But again, why would Bethesda be so eager to remove leader of the Vigilance from the game? There isn't really much else to say about the Vigil. In the end, Faction technically survives as there are other Vigilants left roaming Skyrim and other promises. But will we ever see them again? No one really knows, but Probably not. I just think that it's kind of ironic that one faction in game that is genuinely right about everything they're saying would become least popular or even hated. Vigilant's puritanical approach lacks sarcasm and cynicism found in other, cooler factions, making them probably too stiff and uninteresting to most players. It's a shame because they are so much more than morality police. They are the embodiment of an essentially noble idea and a doctrine dating all the way to the first era. Witch hunters, archaeologists, healers, alchemists, mages, detectives, historians, priests, crusaders, there is a little bit of everything in them. But before all of that, they are the underdogs, forever fighting the evil of this world. In Skyrim, after the destruction of the Hall, no one came to their aid, implying that at this stage they probably operate independently. Vigilants aren't your typical overpowered paladins cloaked in holy light and backed by some powerful deity. They are, in lack of better words, realistic. Not devoid of human weaknesses and faults, struggling on every step to maintain their ideology. It's just a group of underdogs, united in the idea of protecting mortals from immortal evil. I always supported underdogs, defenders who stand firm behind their principles, even at the cost of their life. Overall, it was a good piece of world building by Bethesda. I only wish that at least they gave Vigilance a proper, honorable end. They earned it. The Vigil will be watching you.